Throughout our human history, few civilizations have left as profound a mark as the ancient Sumerians. Flourishing in the land between the rivers, they gifted the world complex stories, beliefs and cultural treasures that still influence our world even today. But did you know that back then their influence extended far beyond the boundaries of their own civilization? It might be shocking, but within the sacred pages of the Hebrew Bible, in the stories of creation, floods and divine encounters, there are ancient Sumerian roots that predate the biblical period. What secrets lie within these ancient texts? And how did the Sumerians shape the biblical stories we hold dear? We'll try to find out together in the new episode of Secret Origins. Welcome. Stories have always played a big role in ancient Near Eastern literature, which includes the Hebrew Bible, also known as the Torah or the Tanakh. The Bible, which is a collection of different works by many writers over a long time, takes inspiration from various cultural and literary traditions, surprisingly including those of the Sumerians. The Sumerians were an ancient civilization in Mesopotamia, modern-day Iraq, existing around 4000 to 2000 BCE. They left behind many stories and myths. You can see their influence in the Bible in different stories and themes, especially the Sumerian creation myth, the Enuma Elish. This myth has a lot in common with the creation story in the book of Genesis in the Bible. But how? Well, both stories talk about how order was made from chaos and the separation of heaven and earth. In Genesis 1-2, the earth is described as empty and dark with God's spirit moving over the water. The Enuma Elish also talks about this water through the characters of Apsu and Tiamat which shows similar themes and language. The Epic of Gilgamesh, another Sumerian story, has a flood tale that is a lot older than the story of Noah's Ark in the Bible. The similarities between these two stories, including building an ark, saving animals and sending out a dove to find land, suggest that the Noah's Ark story might have taken some ideas from the Sumerian flood tale. The Sumerians also had one of the earliest established legal codes, the Sumerian Code of Ur-Namu. This code had a big influence on later legal codes in the ancient Near East, including laws in the Bible books of Exodus, Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Both legal codes share ideas like an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. The proverbs in the Bible are also a lot like Sumerian wisdom literature, such as the instructions of Shurupak and the instructions of Amenemop. Both types of literature give moral guidance and practical advice for life. The writers of the Hebrew Bible adapted these Sumerian stories to fit their own religious and cultural context, showing the clear influence of Sumerian literature on the themes, ideas and story structures of the Hebrew Bible. Stories from the ancient city of Ugarit, now in modern-day Syria, also had an influence on the Bible. Ugarit was active during the Late Bronze Age from 14,000 to 12,000 BCE and their cuneiform texts give us important information about the religious and cultural context of the ancient Near East. These texts from Ugarit include myths, epics and ritualistic scripts that share themes and contribute to elements of the Hebrew Bible. One Ugaritic text, the Baal Cycle, which tells myths about the Canaanite god Baal, shares themes with stories in the Bible. For example, the Baal Cycle talks about a god battling chaotic forces, which is also a theme in the Psalms in the Bible. Ugaritic texts also talk about a divine assembly led by a supreme god, El, which is a similar idea to the heavenly council in the Hebrew Bible led by Yahweh. Ugaritic texts about rituals give us a detailed look at religious rituals for different Ugaritic gods, helping us understand the religious practices and beliefs of the ancient Near East. Some researchers suggest these Ugaritic rituals might have influenced Israel, 
worship, including the structure and content of Psalms. The Ugaritic language, which is very similar to Hebrew, provides language parallels that help us understand certain biblical terms and expressions, improving our understanding and interpretation of Hebrew words in the Bible. The Hebrew Bible is also full of stories and cultural ideas that came from ancient Egypt. One of the most important stories in the Bible, called the Exodus, tells about how the Israelites were freed from slavery in Egypt. This story shares similar themes with Egyptian literature, such as the idea of a savior chosen by God and a battle between the chosen person and a powerful king. Even though the Exodus story is mostly told from the Israelites' viewpoint, it might have been influenced by a real event when a group of people called the Hyksos left Egypt. Some religious scholars try to say this two events are the same, but this is unlikely because they happened hundreds of years apart. We also can't find any characters like Moses, Joshua or Aaron in the Hyksos period. Moreover, the Bible doesn't tell us which pharaoh was in charge during the Exodus, which is strange considering how much we know about all the different pharaohs. The biblical book of Proverbs, which is a full of wise sayings and teachings, is very similar to ancient Egyptian wisdom literature, especially the instructions of Amin Mo. Both these pieces of literature give advice on how to live a good life and how to be wise. Some old versions of the Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, even include Amin Mope's text. There are many parts of the Hebrew Bible that use Egyptian religious symbols and images. For example, the prophet Ezekiel uses symbols that remind us of Egyptian religious pictures to share his message. Pharaohs are always shown as strong leaders and the images connected to Egyptian god and goddesses show how much Egypt influenced other cultures. Even the stone of Hezekiah, an ancient artifact has an Egyptian ark on it. Also the songs and religious practices in the Hebrew Bible are a lot like the ones in ancient Egypt. The Psalms, which are songs of worship and praise, are structured and themed similarly to Egyptian hymns and prayers. Legal ideas in the Hebrew Bible are also similar to Egyptian laws, just like laws from ancient Sumeria and Babylon. But of all the different cultures, it's the Canaanites who most influenced the Hebrew Bible. The Canaanites lived in what is now Israel, Palestine, Lebanon and parts of Jordan and Syria and they worship many different gods. Here are some of the most worshipped Canaanite gods. El or El, who has the same name as the god in the Hebrew Bible, was the most important god in Canaanite religion. He was often shown as an old man with a beard and was known for his wisdom, authority and leadership. El was also the leader of a group of gods called the Divine Council. Baal was a very important god who was associated with storms, fertility and agriculture. Baal was often shown as a strong warrior, holding a lightning bolt, showing that he controlled nature. Asherah was the wife of Il and was considered the mother goddess in Canaanite religion. She represented fertility, motherhood and nurturing. Ashira was often shown as a motherly figure, sometimes with a sacred tree or pole that represented her. Anat was a goddess of war and was associated with battle, violence, protection and wisdom. Anat was often shown as a warrior with a bow, a spear or a shield. Astarte, also known as Ashtoreth, was the goddess of love, beauty and sexuality. She was thought to protect fertility, both in terms of human reproduction and agriculture. Ashtarde was shown as a beautiful goddess decorated with jewelry and symbols of fertility. Dagon was the god of agriculture, grain and fertility and was often shown as a fish-like god representing plenty and fertility linked to water and the prosperity of farming. And of course, Yahweh often called Yahu, was associated with a specific region or tribe instead of being a central figure in the larger Canaanite group of gods. But what was Yahweh's role in the Canaanite religion? Well, 
Well, it's complex and it's still being debated by scholars. Canaanite stories have a big impact on the Hebrew Bible. The Israelites and Canaanites were closely connected historically and culturally. The Canaanites lived in the land of Canaan, which is where Israel is now. Their myths, religious beliefs and rituals like sacrifices and temple worship influenced the Israelites. The Bible often talks about the Israelites' interaction with these Canaanite practices, usually saying they are bad and should be avoided. The process of Canaanite god El becoming part of the Yahweh religion in the Israelite tradition is complex and took a long time. El was the main god in the Canaanite belief system known for authority, leadership and divine counsel. Over time, El and his son Yahweh became one and the same. In the Hebrew Bible, Yahweh and El, or El Elyon, which means God Most High, are used interchangeably. Sometimes the Bible even refers to Yahweh as El Elyon, showing that they're the same. As the Israelites settled in Canaan, they probably took on some Canaanite cultural and religious practices. The worship of El could have influenced the Israelites' understanding of Yahweh, with Yahweh taking on some of El's characteristics. Over time, the Israelites developed their religious identity, possibly combining El and Yahweh into one God, with Yahweh as the primary deity, supreme authority. Both Canaanite and early Israelite beliefs included a divine council, made up of lesser gods. As the Israelite religion developed, they kept this idea of a divine council but with Yahweh leading the council. The Hebrew Bible also shows the influence of other cultures and their stories. The Phoenicians, who lived in the coastal region of what is now Lebanon, had a lot of interactions with the Israelites. They had a significant cultural exchange with evidence of Phoenician stories in the Bible. The nail platonist writer Porphyry wrote that a priest from Beirut named Sanchuniatan wrote a very accurate history because he got the records from another priest named Hiram Bolos. This history, which was approved by the king of Beirut, Abibal, and other investigators, was written around 12,000 years BCE. In Sanchuniatan's history, El, who is also called Cronus, sacrificed his only son, Yahud, to his father in heaven. Afterward, El circumcises himself and makes a rule that all of his descendants must also be circumcised. El was worshipped as the star of Saturn. A Saturday was considered his day, which is also the Sabbath. The Hebrew scribes seem to have borrowed this story for the book of Genesis, where Abraham offers his only son, Isaac as a sacrifice to El, but in the Bible's version, an angel stops Abraham. However, just like in the Phoenician story, Abraham is the first to circumcise himself and make this a custom among the Israelites. Phoenician skills and craftsmanship in sea trade likely influenced the building of the first temple in Jerusalem, known as Solomon's Temple. Phoenician workers and materials were used in its construction and some design and artistic elements may have been inspired by Phoenician styles. The Hebrew Bible mentions Phoenician cities like Tyre and Sidon and their cultural practices. For instance, the story of King Hiram of Tyre working with King Solomon to build the temple shows the close relationship between the Israelites and Phoenicians. The first temple period in ancient Israel refers to the time when the first temple, also known as Solomon's Temple, was in Jerusalem. This period lasted from the 10th century BCE until the Babylonians destroyed the temple in 586 BCE. Understanding religion during this period is tricky and experts have different views about how much people worship multiple gods at this time. The practice of worshipping one god only seems to have started after the Israelites returned from Babylon in the 5th century. Experts suggest that elements of worshipping multiple gods continued during this period. They believe that while Yahweh was seen as the main god, other gods and goddesses were also acknowledged and worshipped. Archaeological evidence, including writings and artifacts found in Jerusalem, show the presence of symbols linked to other deities during this time. Such an example is the Elephantine Jews, who were a Jewish community that lived in the ancient city of Elephantine, 
on an island in the Nile River in Egypt. They lived during the 5th century BCE and left behind a group of documents known as the Elephantine Papyri which give us insights into the religious beliefs and practices of the time. Based on Elephantine Papyri, it seems that the religion of the Elephantine Jews was a mix of Yahweh worship and syncretic elements influenced by the local religious environment. While they saw Yahweh as their main god, they also incorporated certain practices from both Egyptian and Canaanite religious traditions. These Elephantine Jews built a maintained temple dedicated to Yahweh on the island. They considered Yahweh as the top god and looked to him for guidance and protection. However, alongside the worship of Yahweh, they also worship other gods and goddesses like Ashera. The Elephantine Papyri mentioned a god called Yahu, who is often seen as a mixed form of Yahweh in Egyptian gods like Amun. Also, Egyptian gods, especially Khnum, Sadis, and Anuket, were worshipped in Elephantine. These gods were believed to have protective powers and were called upon for things like fertility, health, and general well being. This Elephantine Papyrus shows a level of polytheism, syncretism, and cultural assimilation where different religious traditions existed side by side. In such a way, Elephantine Jews kept a unique religious identity centered around Yahweh but also included beliefs and practices from their surroundings. Their religion shows the complex nature of religious syncreticism and the adaptation of religious traditions in a multicultural context. The exact timeline for when the Torah or the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy was put together in its current monotheistic form is a subject of an academic debate. Most experts agree that these texts were written when the Israelites came back from the Babylonian exile. Religious leaders and writers likely collected, edited it and shaped various religious texts. No Greek, Egyptian, Persian or Syrian sources mentioned the Torah before the 5th century BCE. Moses, Noah and Abraham aren't mentioned in any text before the 5th century BCE. Only kings like David and Omri appear in some stone carvings. But stories of the Flood, the Exodus and the 12 tribes of Israel only appear in popular culture after Alexander the Great beat Persia in the 4th century BCE. Some experts now suggest that the five books of Moses were compiled in Alexandria during the Ptolemaic period. Ancient historians like Herodotus, Xenophon and Thucydides don't even mention Israel in their writings. Why? This suggests that Israel was not a powerful kingdom but just a small city-state. It's possible that these texts existed as separate scrolls during these periods, but most of the world outside the Levant didn't know about them until the 4th century BCE. As we've traveled through the ancient worlds of Sumer, Ugarit, Egypt, Canaan and more, it's clear that their stories, belief and cultural influences significantly shaped the world of the Bible. From the grand adventures of Gilgamesh in Sumer, the dramatic tales of Baal and Ugarit and the spiritual hymns of the Egyptian gods to complex pantheon of Canaanite deities, all of these contributed to the Hebrew Bible. But the Bible authors and editors didn't just copy these stories from neighboring cultures. They creatively combined, reshaped and reused these old stories, spinning them into a new story of faith, history and moral teaching. Let's take the story of Esther and Mordecai as an example. Esther and Mordecai have a lot in common with Ishtar and Marduk. The story of Esther and Mordecai mirrors the story of Ishtar descending into the underworld to save her lover, Tammuz. In the Ishtar and Tammuz story, Tammuz is taken to the underworld and Ishtar descends to rescue him. As she travels through each level of hell, she has to remove a layer of clothing until she reaches the bottom and confronts the queen of the underworld. She stays there for three days until her eunuchs are sent down from heaven to revive her and she brings Tammuz back to life, marking the start of spring. The biblical story of Esther shows similar parallels. Instead of Tammuz, we have Mordecai. Mordecai, like Tammuz, is taken into dungeon and Esther, like Ishtar, must go to King Xerxes of Persia to plead for Mordecai's safety. Her eunuch priests, just like Ishtar's, 
help her and she also removes layers of her clothing. The story seems to be inspired by the Sumerian tale. It's our belief that the biblical writers didn't mean any harm, they were simply retelling sacred stories that everyone knew. The comparison of Sumerian, Canaanite and Egyptian mythologies with the biblical narratives gives us a deeper understanding of the socio-cultural interconnections between these ancient civilizations. These stories of these cultures often share common themes and motives, revealing a historical exchange of ideas and cultural integration. This also showcases humanity's unending quest to make sense of the world and their place within it. For instance, the Sumerian flood narrative mirrors the story of Noah's Ark in the Bible, showcasing a common theme of divine catastrophe followed by human salvation. Similarly, the Canaanite storm god Baal's conflict with Yam, the sea god, is echoed in the biblical depiction of Yahweh triumphing over chaos. Furthermore, the grandiosity of Egyptian cosmology enhances the descriptions of heaven and earth found in the book of Genesis. One fascinating example of this cultural interplay is the parallel between the stories of Esther in the Hebrew Bible and Ishtar in Sumerian mythology, even their names. Both stories told around the same time of year symbolize the death of winter and the resurrection of spring. Both Esther and Ishtar are women of power who intervene to save someone they care about, and their stories culminate in a joyful celebration which is echoed in the annual festivals dedicated to them. This exploration into the world of ancient mythologies highlights not just the shared motives and cultural exchange, but also the universal truths embedded within these diverse narratives. As we delve into the depths of history and reality, we're not only uncovering the roots of our collective heritage, but also realizing the enduring influence of storytelling in shaping civilizations and defining our true identities. Don't stop exploring, don't stop looking, don't stop trying to find new answers. We bow before you and thank you for watching another episode of Secret Origins. Keep your minds open and until we meet again.